Hello, gospel revolutionaries around the world. This is Daniel Rouse. Welcome to the Bonus Room Study. So happy to have you here. Uh, I just love these short little times that we get to get together. Um, get to get to get to get together. <laughs> I had a skip in my tongue there. Um, you know, I just really enjoy um, just sharing, um, not only when I present, but also when Michael's sharing. And I, I hope you really benefit this and you know, one of the things that I hope you really gather and understand from what we do is we are, we're on a path of learning and we're on a journey to discovering truth and searching the scriptures. Um, you know, we, we've done some sessions and we've gotten some feedback, which we absolutely love. We really do love feedback. And, uh, but I, I want you to know that, you know, as we're presenting these things, we're midway through understanding what it is that we're even presenting. For example, um, <clears throat> during the conference a couple weeks ago, I shared about heaven. And um, the, the feedback that we got is that, you know, well, what does that mean? You know, it doesn't really help. It doesn't really answer the question of what heaven is. Uh, you know, it leaves more questions than answers. You've taken away our blessed hope and all of that. And that's not our intention. The, the purpose of it is, is it's, we're on a journey to discover. And that one session that I did, I think is a prelude to many other sessions coming. And we certainly are not taking heaven away. Uh, however, heaven might look a little different than a street of gold or a gate, pearly gates. And some of these things that we attributed to heaven as a future destination are actually symbols that speak of who we are and what we have today. And uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there at the beginning here to say, you know, our, our understanding of heaven and all of the topics that we've been covering, my goodness, there's been so many of them, um, they're works in progress. And as we learn, we share. As we learn more, we correct and then we share. And you know, we're correcting ourselves, we're correcting uh, what we see other people doing. So um, I, I just hope you're along for the journey. Understand that our method methodology is very different from what uh, some other ministries do. Um, in that when we present this, we're not saying this is the whole truth, all truth, so help me God. Um, this is the truth as we understand it. And we understand that it is likely to be flawed uh, in, in whole, in part. Uh, it's just where we are at the moment and what we're understanding at the moment. But what we have seen in this wonderful year is it progresses. And so as we begin to share something, we learn something more. We begin to share something, we get your feedback, we get your questions, and then we learn something new and it sharpens and it gets better and better and better. So, uh, you know, that's our methodology here on how at the Gospel Revolution we present what we're learning, we present what we're sharing. Um, it's, it's all in that mode. It's all in a process of learning. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to learn until we study war no more. That's our goal. That's our mission. So uh, buckle up because it's going to be a great ride. Now, I want to get back to my topic that I have been sharing uh, on and off here for the past few months, and that is, what the hell? And tonight, specifically, what the Hades? So I talked about uh, in the previous episodes that I did on hell um, about some of the definitions of hell. So in the Greek language, we have a couple words that are translated into the English language as hell. Uh, one of which is Gehenna. Um, and in the Old Testament, this would be in the Hebrew language, uh, it's known as the Valley of Hinnom. And uh, we looked at that and how uh, that was actual a physical place outside the city of Jerusalem. Um, then we looked at another word that people claim is in the New Testament, and it's a Greek word, and that's Tartarus. But the word Tartarus is not in the New Testament. Uh, the Greek word that's in the New Testament that people mistake to be Tartarus is Tartaru. And the big difference between Tartarus and Tartaru is Tartarus 
is a noun. It's a person, place, or thing. And tartaru is a verb. It's an action. And uh, so we worked through that one. And um, the last ones that kind of remain as words that are actually translated as hell um, in the Greek is known as Hades or Hades. Uh, and in the Hebrew, a similar term, uh, which is often cross-translated, is the word Sheol. So we have Sheol and Hades. So we had Gehenna, uh, the Valley of Hinnom, and we had Tartaru. Uh, these are words that are translated. Now, there are other ones that I hope in the future I'll get into, um, and it's terms like the pit. Uh, it's terms like the lake of fire. Uh, we'll actually touch on that one briefly here tonight if time allows. Um, so these are terms that are uh, used and correlated as synonyms to hell. And my purpose for sharing this is to blow out of the water the worst doctrine that ever existed on the planet. And that is the doctrine of hell. Uh, hell is made up 100%. I am so confident with every fiber of my being that there is not a place that matches the description of evangelicals teaching on hell. Uh, Christianity in general, uh, their teaching on hell. That place does not exist, uh, at least according to the Bible. And we cannot use the Bible to paint a picture of that. What we are seeing, and this is kind of where I want to get into some of this tonight, is what we are seeing these terminologies that have come, that we've come to learn and understand this great picture of a hell with fire and brimstone and people uh, cages and people screaming and being melted and then being rebirthed almost and then being melted again and just uh, eternal torment and all of these things. These pictures do not come from the Bible. Yes, they come from the Bible that is mistranslated and misunderstood and taken out of context. But uh, really, these ideas come from Greek mythology. Uh, they come from other religions. They come from man's ideas. Uh, Dante's Inferno has a big part to play in our modern understanding of hell, uh, as speaking as a Christian understanding of hell. Uh, but tonight I want to look at this word, uh, Hades and Sheol. So the first time that we see that Sheol is used in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 35, uh, excuse me, 37 and verse 35. And you might remember the story. Uh, this is uh, Jacob and his son, Joseph. Remember Joseph with the uh, multicolored tunic? And his brother sold him off as a slave. And then they brought his tunic back to his father and it was covered in blood. And uh, they had misled their father to think that their son, his son was dead. And this was his favorite son. And this is his response in that story. Genesis chapter 37 and verse 35. And all his, that's Jacob's sons, and all his daughters arose to comfort him but he refused to be comforted and he said, for I shall go down into the grave. Now this word that's here is grave is the Hebrew word sheol. And I shall go down into sheol, into the grave, uh, to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now, our understanding in the modern day of hell is that it's a place for sinners. Now, Jacob is what we would consider, uh, you know, uh, he, he was a hero of faith and, and he was a good person. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I know I'm not going to get into the who goes to heaven, who goes to hell thing here. But if, if righteous people were to go to uh, hell... Uh, then we got a problem. Now, what's really interesting is that you'll find, and Don Barris Bartlett pointed this out, and um, we can do some more research on it. We might maybe just have a session where we just go through that. Is in some translations, what you'll find out is oftentimes where you see Sheol, when it's talking about, as Jacob talked about here, it's translated as grave. But when it's talking about, and 
uh, what we would consider an evil person, it's translated as the word hell, which is really interesting. I mean, that, if, if there's a biased translation, that's a biased translation. So in other words, let's lighten the load here for people that we would consider righteous or our hero of faith. And uh, for everybody else, let, let's just throw them into hell. <laughs> you know, and that's basically what's been done and uh, through these mistranslations. So this is the first time that this word is used in the Bible. Uh, Sheol is used in the Bible. If this was in, in the Greek Septuagint, it would have been translated as the Greek word Hades, Hades. And uh, so we see that in this understanding that it's not uh, just the fiery pit of somewhere, but even in the Old Testament, uh, the father of faith, one of the fathers of faith, one of the righteous, righteous people, uh, he fully expected that not only was he going to hell, but so was his son, Joseph. Now, that's if, I say all of that to say, that's if we hold to this idea of what hell is, that it's a fiery pit of torment forever and ever. Um, but that's not what's the understanding. Now, let me just give you a, an understanding of what the picture was in his mind when he said this. Now, it's translated as grave. And, you know, people have uh, said that many, many times that, hey, you know, well, Hades is just the grave and Sheol is just the grave. And the Christians fight back and say, well, if that's true, then why do we also have a word for grave? And let me give you an understanding of that. The word Hades in the Greek, Hades, uh, ha is a negative and Ds is to see. It means to see. So basically Hades in, in what the word is basically means to not see. That when you die, you go to the place that you don't see, uh, which coming out of the, the conference that we just taught about the, the invisible, the shadows and the visible, uh, that'll really preach. But I want to stay focused here on, 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 on my point is that uh, what they were saying, and if I could define what Hades and Shield was in a very simple term, it was the communal grave. It was where everybody communally uh, in, a, in a picture, if you could think of all the dead people surrounded in one thing, uh, that's kind of what Sheol was. Now, it wasn't like a grave that you would go to visit, uh, a mausoleum, it wasn't something like that. It wasn't, you know, my mother, she's buried in a cemetery. It's not that kind of grave. It's a grave where everybody as a picture uh, found themselves as a, in a communal place. So. What basically Joseph was saying is, you know, uh, I'm going to go down into the grave to my son, who is, he expected to be dead, which he wasn't, but he expected him to be dead. And he said, so I'm going to go in in sorrow and I'm going to go to the same place that my son is. And he expected that that would be the place. Now, everybody thought this. This was just an understanding. Now, what happened uh, through Christian uh, history is you now have a group of people who really hold to the idea, just like uh, Jacob did, that this is like a communal grave, you know? Um, basically like where I'm at today, where I don't know. I don't know what it looks like, you know? It's somewhere, it's something, it's the unseen. It's, it's uh, nobody knows, it's, it's not a street of gold or different things like that. But what happened in the history of this teaching and this understanding is all of a sudden um, we have some more uh, understanding coming as other religions start releasing ideas. Uh, you get some Greek mythology, you get Egyptian uh, <laughs> uh, mythology, I don't know what you would call it, uh, Egyptian religion uh, mixed into this. And all of a sudden you've got these ideas arising, these ideas developing as to what and where uh, hell is. And then you get into, well, see the Pharisees and the Sadducees were split on this idea. Uh, and I'm holding back from saying my favorite joke that that's why they were so Sadducee. 
<laughs> but you see, the Pharisees stood on one side. And what the Pharisees kind of held to the idea that Christianity does today is that there's a hell. Um, and in Sheol, now they, they hold into the Hebrew teaching of it, into Sheol, there's a good section and there's a bad section. There's a place for the good people. There's a place for the evil people. There's a place of punishment and there's a place of paradise. That all of this was in the singular place of Sheol. Now, that idea is not presented in the Bible. Now, I will show you uh, here as we go into the New Testament uh, that the place where that is seen is the rich man and Lazarus. Now, it, that's really interesting that if you look at that parable, uh, and I like to point out a uh, parable, uh, people look at it as being a very true story. I was taught in Christianity that it was a very true story, that there was a man, Lazarus, uh, and there was um, the rich man. There was a rich man and there was a Lazarus who was poor and in a paradise and one was in the, the bad side of it. And you see Jesus sharing this parable. What's very interesting though, with what I just said about the two different ideas, you have the, the Pharisees who are believing as Christianity does today, that there's a place that, that's filled with torment and pain and, and sorrow and blah, blah, blah. And then you have a place that's, uh, that's not. But then the Sadducees are just like Jacob. And they're just like, hey, we don't, under, we don't know. We don't have any expectation to what's gonna happen when we die. But to give it a name, to give it a place that we will depart to, we're going to call it Sheol. We're going to call it the grave, the communal grave where everybody's buried, not uh, where my bones are buried, but if our soul or wherever that they were trying to think, if we lived on, where would we go? What would we do? So you have these two schools of thoughts. Now, when the story of rich man and Lazarus comes around, guess who Jesus was talking to? The Pharisees. The audience that Jesus had before him was the Pharisees and a couple of his disciples. I'm gonna look over here to see my time because I don't have a time on my phone. So the Pharisees were, had an audience with Jesus. And what parable did Jesus teach him? He taught him rich man and Lazarus. Hmm, why? Well, history shows us and some uh, theologians think and have you know some evidence and some of these things they're just so long gone in history that it's really hard to come to a, a firm understanding of it but it fits into the big picture and that's why i want to share it with you is that there is speculation that the story of rich man and lazarus didn't originate with jesus in the bible that there is actually stories told with the same names and the same characters and the same ideas that jesus shared in egyptian understanding that this was an Egyptian idea that was laid out. So this is where I'm saying that in the middle of all of these original ideas that come, as humanity progressed down the road in history and other religions came along, uh, Christianity and even Jewish religions begin to pull in these ideas and take a little bit here and take a little bit there. It's even today. You know, one of the first books that I read coming out of Christianity was a book recommended by Don Barris Bartlett. And uh, that book was titled Pagan Christianity. Uh, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it. Powerful book. I was a pastor of a church. And as I'm reading this and I see everything from the steeple to the pulpit to the people sitting in a congregation to the pastor standing on the stage, all had pagan uh, roots in it. Uh, absolutely amazing. Blew my mind how much Christianity pulled out of pagan religion into Christianity. And, <laughs> and it happened with hell too. What the Hades? is going on here. So when we talk about the rich man and Lazarus, that's what's happening. He had an audience with the, um, with the Pharisees. And as he had this audience with the Pharisees, that's exactly what he addressed was their perspective of what they were doing. Now, Jesus did this more than once. Paul did it too. And dividing the Pharisees and the Sadducees got them fighting amongst each other. 
And uh, that was all done on purpose and there was a reason for it. And so if we look at that story and understand the historical sense of it, we understand who was speaking and who they were speaking to, we understand that the rich man and Lazarus sows a very different picture. Now, in the New Testament, and excuse me for going real fast, I want to try to get this all out, and we'll expound on some of these things a little bit further as, as we, we continue this study. In the New Testament, the word Hades is used 11 times. Um, Jesus uses it uh, about three or four times. Um, and of course, we have that repeated a couple times throughout the uh, Gospels. But one of the statements that he made uh, is he was kind of condemning Capernaum. And he said, Capernaum, uh, you're headed to the grave. You're headed to Hades, uh, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, all of a sudden, because of Sodom and Gomorrah, and because we think of evil uh, that took place there, all of a sudden we now paint the picture of whatever God's, whatever Jesus is condemning them to um, is a bad place. It's a horrible place. Uh, but basically, he was pronouncing death over them. That's basically what he was saying. It wasn't that I'm going to throw you into the lake of fire. It wasn't that I'm going to torture you forever and ever. It wasn't any of that. It was the fact that your life is going to be cut short. You know, that was kind of the gospel message that Jesus preached over and over. Uh, wages of sin is death death. <laughs> and so all of these, as he went on, these are the graphic pictures that he painted of death. Uh, another term that Jesus used, remember the story uh, where Peter said, you are the Christ. And Jesus said, uh, and I will call you Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. Huh. So Jesus is saying whatever Hades is, whatever it is, it's not going to prevail against the church. And we know that the church is all of humanity. So, uh, you know, we could kind of just shut off the teaching right now and just jump in the boat with Michael and say, hey, it's irrelevant because uh, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the church. So whatever it is or was or going to be <laughs> doesn't even matter. But um, we'll, we'll continue on. Then we have the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, in the book of Acts, when Paul is teaching about it, I think it was Paul, uh, Peter might have as well, uh, they reference actually Psalms, uh, that you will not leave my soul in hell, in Sheol. So apparently there was an understanding uh, that whatever Jesus, wherever Jesus went, he went to the grave, he went to hell, he went to Sheol, he went to Hades, and God was not going to leave him there, his soul there. And uh, which really paints a beautiful work of from heaven to earth to the grave and up from the grave he rose, up from Hades he rose. <laughs> so out of the grave he rose. So we have this whole picture, everything in heaven, everything on earth and everything under the earth. All of that was taken care of through the death, burial and resurrection of the cross. And then we have what is perhaps the conclusion of what hell is to us today. And I, I hope out of anything that I've said that you come to this. I have some questions about some of the things I shared with you, some of the historical ideas uh, that were presented and different things like that. Uh, some of that is, is still to be researched. Some of that is still to be proven. But this conclusion I am firmly founded on because it is firmly founded here in the Bible. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 55, he says, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So whatever sting that death had, whatever power the grave or Hades have, which is really interesting again, if you look in a lot of the translations of the Bible, this is the only time it's translated as grave. <laughs> Every other time it's translated as hell. 
I, I'm just thinking if we read it that way. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where's your victory? You have no victory because Jesus is the victory and he conquered death, hell, and the grave. Woo, that'll preach, brother. Now, I wanna go to um, Hosea, which is where Paul quoted this. And I almost forgot, so I didn't mark it in my Bible, but let's see if I can find the little book of Hosea. And we're going to chapter 13 and verse 14. Now, this is what the Apostle Paul was quoting when he wrote that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. I will ransom them from the power of Sheol. Ooh, I will ransom them from the power of Sheol, of the grave. I will redeem them from death. I love this next statement. O oh, death, I will be your plague. O oh, grave, O oh, Hades, O oh, Sheol, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from mine eyes. O oh, hell, O oh, Hades, O oh, Sheol, I, the Lord God, will be your destruction. That's the prophecy that came from Hosea. I will be thy destruction. If we believe that Jesus fulfilled all prophecy, then that is exactly what he did on the cross as he defeated death, hell, and the grave. He defeated Sheol. He defeated Hades. He defeated Gehenna. You put whatever name you want on it. Tartarus, Tartaru. <laughs> he defeated it. It's a done deal and it is destroyed. I will be thy destruction. Whatever this grave was, is no longer. Whatever Hades was, is no longer. And the gates of Hades will not prevail. Of course, it's not gonna prevail because Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, destroyed it. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? That's why the death of Jesus was absolutely necessary. Oh, I, I, I get so annoyed that people think it wasn't necessary, it wasn't important, it was absolutely, according to the biblical story and the biblical prophecy, it was absolutely necessary. <laughs> I'm getting a little excited, getting a little wound up, I'm keeping you long, but we'll get through this. I will be thy destruction. Now, I believe that Jesus came and he not only fulfilled the law, but he also fulfilled the prophets. The prophet Hosea spoke this by the hand of God, by the mouth of God, and he destroyed it. Now, we've been kind of going in and out of the book of Revelation. And in closing, I wanna share what Revelation says about this. Uh, this is Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13. Then, then the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Isn't it interesting about how that is written? That and they were judged, each one, according to his works works. It's appointed unto men die and then comes judgment. Uh, and, and we believe that that all took place on the cross. Jesus says now is the judgment of the world. And so he took upon him. So this is talking about, if we put this in the timeline, this is talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Verse 14, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life, we're cast into the lake of fire. I, I know I threw that out there, verse 15. That's a verse that we'll go through. We have actually gone through it. If you search our website about the book of life, uh, we've actually done podcasts and different things on it. And for lack of time, I'm, I'm not even gonna uh, reference it. But if you want more information, go to the website and just look, gospelrevolution.com and look up um, 
uh, the, the Book of Life. Uh, I think it was Don Barris Bartlett that did a whole session just teaching on that, uh, what the Bible talks about the Book of Life. But what I wanted to point out here is that even in Revelation, the conclusion to Hades, the conclusion to Sheol, is that it was thrown into the lake of fire. It was destroyed. Just like Hosea prophesied, God saying, I will be thy destruction. I will destroy Sheol and Hades. It's a done deal, folks. It's a done deal. Review. Let's review what we just said. The understanding that we have of Hades and Sheol today has come from not the Bible, but a mixture of biblical teaching alongside of other religions. Uh, Greek mythology is probably a big part to play in that. And uh, even Jesus addressed some of these teachings. Even Jesus used some of these teachings to make his point to a people who believe that that to be true, as he did with the rich man and Lazarus. That was a story that they were very familiar with, and Jesus taught it to them, again, in a parable, to devise them, to confuse them, and to blind them. That's why Jesus taught in parables. That's what the story says. It was used to confuse. And what we have done, and what I was taught in Christianity, and I even taught it myself, is that the rich man was a real man and Lazarus was a real man. And these were, it was a discussion that actually took place between these two men. It was a parable, folks. And it was a parable that quite likely has non-biblical foundings on it. And Jesus used it to a group of people who believed it to be true. Put all of that aside. And we have a conclusion. We have a conclusion about Sheol. We have a conclusion about Hades. I will be thy destruction. Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The gates of Sheol shall not prevail against the church. No victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, O Hades, O hell, O Sheol, where is your victory? You don't have it because our victory is found in Jesus Christ and whatever Sheol, Hades, hell was, it was cast into the lake of fire. Our God is a consuming fire. I'm gonna give you a little tease as to where we go when we start talking about the lake of fire. We talk about the pit that burns, the fire that burns. What is this all about? There is a biblical answer to it, and it is something that we can find. But I hope as you go through this, you'll have that same question as I did. What the hell? Tonight, what the Hades? What the Hades? And remember, you're righteous. <laughs>